North Dakota, USA, 67 million years ago. Rivers and wetlands dominate the landscape. Their waters flowing eastward toward a vast inland sea. It's green, lush, and inhabited by spectacularly large creatures. It is the end of the Cretaceous period, the pinnacle of dinosaur evolution, when some of our most beloved giant reptiles walked the Earth. Triceratops. Tyrannosaurus. And a 12 meter, 3 ton herbivore called a hadrosaur. It is here where our story begins. Hadrosaurs were the cows of the Cretaceous, munching their days away on vegetation when they weren't running for their lives. But while they may have been one of T-Rex's favorite meals, they were also one of the most successful dinosaurs of the time. More hadrosaur fossils have been found poking out of the earth than most any other dinosaur. This particular hadrosaur, though, is special, if not in life, then in death. Rather than just fossilized bones and teeth, its skin, tissues, and maybe even organs somehow survived across the eons. It's as if the animal locked eyes with some Cretaceous-aged Medusa and turned to stone. This is a dinosaur mummy, one of only a handful ever found. To Dr. Phil Manning of the University of Manchester, England, who's been leading the research on the find, it's the opportunity of a lifetime. Dinosaur fossils are usually isolated bones. Occasionally we're very lucky and get a partial skeleton, and exceptional circumstances, we get a complete skeleton articulated. That is the absolute 10 out of 10 for a dinosaur. Dinosaur mummies come in off the scale. These are so rare. So rare, and so brimming with scientific promise, that even a single dinosaur mummy has the potential to change our understanding of all dinosaurs. So far, the fossilized dinosaur bones of natural history museums, sometimes as little as a tooth or an arm, have told scientists like Manning practically everything they know about these extinct reptiles. From their skeletons, they know how big they were. But without tissue and flesh to fill them out, they don't really know how the animals looked. From the size and shape of a dinosaur's leg bones, scientists have estimated how these animals moved. But without muscles, they can't know how fast. By comparing the bones of some animals with others, we have discovered some 300 different species of dinosaur. But without genes and proteins, we can't say for sure how they came about or what they evolved into. A dinosaur mummy, with its tissues frozen in time, will give researchers the chance to investigate, as never before, 
the real inner workings of these ancient animals, opening a rare window on how they lived. It is quite fair to say that our dinosaur mummy makes many other dinosaurs look like roadkill, simply because the evidence we're getting from our creature is so complete compared to the disjointed sort of skeletons that we're usually having to draw conclusions from. With fossilized skin samples, measures of muscle mass, and perhaps even genetic material, our well-preserved dinosaur mummy has kicked off an investigation befitting King Tut, including the largest high-resolution CT scan ever attempted. With a live animal, you can dissect, you can open the body cavity, shove your head in, have a look at the gore, great! You can't do it when it's been mummified and it's made of stone, which ours is. The massive X-ray source owned by NASA and run by Boeing to detect flaws in space shuttle parts may expose anything from what these dinosaurs ate to how they moved to the number of chambers in their hearts. But before we get closer to unlocking any of these secrets, we have to rewind back to the beginning. It's called the Hell Creek Formation. But to paleontologists, this part of North Dakota is pure heaven. All those dinosaurs that led happy, fruitful lives here on these ancient floodplains also died here. making Hell Creek a hotbed for fossils. Our dinosaur mummy's 67 million year slumber comes to an end one summer day in 1999, when high school sophomore Tyler Leeson is out on one of his routine prospecting runs. Leeson has walked just about every inch of this land. It's been in his family for decades, and he's been hunting fossils on it since he was practically a toddler. As a teenager, he has already headed 20 dinosaur excavations. Even so, nothing could prepare him for what he finds protruding from that rocky hillside. I followed the, the bone fragments up the little gully, and I saw two spinal bones sticking out of the hill. That's not the unusual part. Well-preserved dinosaur bones are scattered all over Hell Creek. These were different. They were together. They were articulated, you know, so they were in the, in the correct order as in life. And that in itself is quite rare. Leeson rounded up his crew and began excavating the site removing more and more rocks and dirt, he realized there was a whole lot more to these fossils than just bones. I knocked off a little piece of what I thought was just sandstone, and I, I looked at it, and it had a weird pattern to it. And so I brought the piece of sandstone back to the lab, and after hours and hours of slowly brushing it, the scale started to appear. Leeson held in his hands the scaly skin of an animal that had been extinct for 65 million years. Even more intriguing, that skin retained its 3D shape. The skin hadn't collapsed in around the bone. And at that point, I knew that we had a 3D dinosaur mummy. I was absolutely thrilled. To a paleontologist, nothing could have been more exciting. But to be clear, dinosaur mummies aren't anything like the dried up human ones we find in Egypt or the Andes. There were no embalmers running around in the late Cretaceous. Our mummy, now dubbed Dakota after its home turf, 
is a fossil like other dinosaurs. But unlike reconstructed museum skeletons, what's extraordinary is that Dakota seems to have fossilized with most of its skin and organs intact. Dinosaur mummies form much the way all fossils do. Typically, when the biological machinery of an animal shuts down, if scavengers and the elements don't get to it first, microorganisms feast on the remains. It doesn't sit there just being kind. It stinks. It starts degrading, breaking down. It's a fettered mass of rotting flesh. Horrible stuff. It could take weeks, months, or years, depending on the animal and the environment. But the microbes will eventually disintegrate the body, bones and all. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Now, obviously, this isn't the case with fossils. Usually, we find fossils in what's called sedimentary rock. Rock formed out of sediments, things like mud and sand. Things you'd expect to find on a floodplain. Which explains why Hell Creek is so fruitful. In most cases, the animal dies and gets covered over by sediments very quickly, often at the bottom of a lake or river. Underwater, the decaying process slows down, and hard things like bone and teeth get preserved for thousands of years. Enough time for geologic scale forces to take over. Through the eons, sediment piles up, gets heavier and heavier, and tissue gets replaced by mineral. In the end, the fossil that's left has only traces, if any, of the original material. It has the same shape, even texture, but chemically, a fossil is a rock. And so is our dino mummy. This piece is the very first skin fossil that we found out at the mummy site. How Dakota's soft part survived is still a mystery. Perhaps its skin turned to leather, protecting it before it could decompose. All we can say is that somehow its tissues avoided rotting away long enough to fossilize along with the bones. It's a process that doesn't happen very often. One of the first dino mummies unearthed was in Wyoming in 1908 by famed fossil hunter Charles Sternberg. It also happened to be a hadrosaur. The skin was preserved, but was lying almost directly on the bones. The internal organs had dried up or rotted away. A handful of mummies have been found since, but so far the scientists believe Dakota seems to be one of the most complete. Once Leeson realizes he has a dino mummy on his hands, the excavation goes into full that's, swing. That's okay. I'm right on? Yeah, you're right on. All right, here we go. There used to be a whole gumdrop shaped butte. That was about the height of my head, approximately, just over the, the rock right there. And so then we dug down to the sandstone that encased the animal, and then we dug down around the entire thing, and now we're digging underneath of it. Leeson soon catches glimpses of the amazing skin and toenail material, and isn't about to take chances with what he believes to be the best preserved dino mummy ever found. A fellow student connects him with Phil Manning, who's been working with well-preserved fossils for some 20 years. Who needs the channel tunnel? <laughs> we could do it. <laughs> when you first lay eyes upon such a remarkable specimen, you are absolutely gobsmacked. How can you not be excited? It's an incredible find. Right. Which side do you want to... Uh... 
Manning quickly assembles a research team and wastes no time scouring the dig site for clues to Dakota's past. How did it live? How did it die? And how did it get preserved? They begin by painting a picture of the world it lived in with a high-tech mapping technique called LIDAR. By bouncing laser beams across the terrain, LIDAR generates high-resolution 3D maps of the area, as it is now, and as it once was. OK, how many base stations are we up to now? So now, in total, we've done 12. That's a lot of data. It is a lot of data. It's going to keep us very busy. Manchester's Dr. Dave Hodgetts can then overlay the new data onto existing relief maps of North Dakota. When you have the data in 3D, in virtual reality like this, we can see exactly what's unique about where the dinosaur is found. And that may give us some insights into why the preservation is so good. Whereas most of us see just a bunch of rock and sand, LIDAR reveals much more. By peering into the sediment and mapping out different layers, different parcels of time, it gives us glimpses of Hell Creek's past. Its ancient geological events, like floods, droughts, volcanic eruptions, and where Dakota fits in. You start building up this picture. It's not just a rock anymore. It is a snapshot in time. It is a place which, if you can close your eyes, you can go back to now and reconstruct it. So far, what LIDAR has been able to reconstruct is the lush environment Dakota lived in. 65 million years ago, the planet Earth was a very different place. If you're out there in space looking down, you wouldn't recognize our planet. There was a huge inland sea taking up vast areas in the Midwest of North America. The sea and the rivers that fed into it made Hell Creek prime real estate in the late Cretaceous, allowing all sorts of large animals, including our hadrosaur, to thrive. Over the eons, the dinosaurs died off, the rivers dried up, new land formed and eroded away. But we still find traces of that old, wet west. LIDAR indicates a large river cut through this area, within 30 meters of Dakota's final resting place. If it had moved just this hundred feet, it would have completely wiped out our fossil. With these macro details of Dakota's watery world in hand, the scientists can now begin to make sense of the micro the actual river sediments that make our dinosaur mummy up. Sedimentologist Dr. Joe McQuaker believes Dakota didn't just spend time near water, but under it. Otherwise, microorganisms would have completely devoured the remains. That can't have been the case here. We know here that the dinosaur has been replaced by the mineral iron carbonate. Iron carbonate, it turns out, comes from microorganisms too, but from bacteria that live in environments devoid of oxygen, like at the bottom of a river. These bacteria also feast on dead animal, but in much more minute quantities than their air-breathing counterparts. They produce the iron carbonate as a byproduct, and over time that mineral would get compressed back into the animal's remains. That's how you preserve this dinosaur. The sediment findings, together with the LIDAR data, establish in remarkable detail the environment the animal died in and what may have happened to it shortly after death. Results that could explain Dakota's remarkable journey and pave the way for bigger and better dino mummies. With the first batch of experiments complete, 
We now know that Dakota likely died in or near a body of water, submerged quickly enough to escape scavengers and the nastiest of microbes, and was covered over and compressed by a continuous supply of sediment. It's probably a very rare event, but by understanding that event, keying into the position in the environmental conditions which would have created such a creature, if we can nail that down, that this could be a key to unlocking a box full of dinosaur mummies. Perhaps one day, thanks to findings like these, scientists will find more dino mummies than they know what to do with. In the meantime, this team anxiously excavates the only one they have. Everything, from how this dinosaur looked to how it moved and evolved, may be hiding in this rock. But before they can unlock any of these secrets, they have to pry their mummy from the ground. Wrap it up and ship it off to their research lab. Okay. A lot of stuff here. Yeah. We've seen glimpses of, of the entire animal all the way, all the way through this block. I mean, right now it looks like a big blob, but we know there's an entire dinosaur encased in, in the big white blob. About four and a half tons worth of dinosaur, in fact. A one-ton block that encases just the animal's tail, along with the three-and-a-half-ton body block. Touchdown! With both of them packed and ready to go, Dakota the Hadrosaur is on the move for the first time in 67 million years. It doesn't go very far, just south of the border, to the Black Hills Institute in Hill City, South Dakota. Now, the scientists finally get to peel back the outer layers and look inside. To most of us, it's a massive hunk of rock. Yes. It's a dinosaur. To Manning and colleague Pete Larson, it may as well be a hunk of gold. Uh, I think we may be starting into finding the, the head. And, and uh, this has got some skin on it, you can see. Skin and head? Yes, maybe. If this is the head, and that's a crack in the sheath again, there's only one place it can come from. And that's the beak. Exactly. <laughs> so you're literally holding the nose of a dinosaur here. And that would be a first. The scientists are excited but cautious at this point. The keratinous sheath they've discovered may also be part of a foot. So we just have to keep working and see what we've got. But we should, if it is, we'd see an eye over here, beautiful cheek right there. This, this is when the, the x-ray vision comes in helpful. We need to know what's inside that's, yep, that's here. Right. I think a CT scan would help us hugely with this specimen. With the CT scan still months ahead, the scientists continue to chisel away the answers the old-fashioned way. A painstakingly slow process on such a well-preserved specimen. You're going down millimeter by millimeter, and we're trying to find the soft tissue before we go through the soft tissue. And so that's particularly challenging. They soon discover that the right side of the dinosaur, that's the exposed side here, isn't as well preserved as they had initially hoped. There is no skin or tissue surrounding the bones in the chest or the base of the back. Whether that's from scavengers or whether it's from a prey animal taking a huge chunk out of the back of our animal, causing its death, the jury is still out. We've had 150, nearly 200 years of people looking at this particular animal saying that's what it looks like. We've been wrong. If we're wrong with hadrosaurs, we could be wrong with many other groups. We could have a T-Rex with a double chin for all we know. As more and more specks of rock get carefully chipped away, Dakota gives us a more complete picture. 
etched into its arms and tail. Alternating bands of large and small scales provide telltale signs of how this animal may have really looked. We find similar size changes in modern day lizards, where each change is associated with a different color. The same may hold true for this hadrosaur. This possibly indicates that we have almost a striped camouflage pattern on some parts of our animal, which is very exciting. Because up until now, that's been conjecture. That's been based upon artistic interpretation. The scales still don't tell us what color Dakota was. That was swamped by the color of the sediments that fossilized it. But with a little poetic license, we can now say for the first time that rather than a single solid shade, the animal likely sported a distinct display of stripes. A few more months of chipping reveals a discovery straight out of Hollywood. What's happening to the sediment around it? It's got a completely different color to the surrounding sediment. Yeah, look at this. It turns out Dakota wasn't alone in this rocky grave throughout the eons. So here's the this very strange hand. That is wicked. This is the hand. You can it appears an ancient crocodile crawled or drifted into the dinosaur and fossilized right alongside it. Crocs were common during the Cretaceous, having already been chomping on fish and small animals for nearly 150 million years. To find an association of two organisms from over 65 million years ago is rare in the fossil record. And it's so rare for vertebrates, I can probably name the other examples. So this is a really important find. So do you think there's any more of this beast stuck underneath the mummy? I don't know. Once again, it will take the CT scan to determine why and how the croc got there. But once the team's shaken loose all they can from the surrounding rock, it's time to look deeper into the fossil itself to see if the very living tissues that once brought the large reptile to life are still trapped inside it. After 67 million years, Dakota is more rock than dinosaur. But if there's still skin, if there's still toenail and bone, might there still be traces of the original animal left? Like the very molecules that make a dinosaur a dinosaur. Genetic material like protein and DNA. When you find something that has the potential to preserve organics, that is truly remarkable. So for the science of paleontology to say it's exciting would be the understatement of the century. To find out if any organics still lurk within Dakota, Tyler Leeson hand delivers samples of the animal to Manning and his team in England. Are these the precious these cargo are brought over? Very careful. Soft tissues that can be the perfect reservoir for organic material. This is essentially a toenail, a clipping of a toenail. <laughs> <laughs> Dinosaur toenails. <laughs> now, Geochemist Dr. Roy Wogalius is about to determine what, if any, of the real Dakota still exists. What I propose that we do is that we take some of this relatively precious material and actually dissolve it. <laughs> how much do you have to dissolve? How, 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 dissolve the mummy? Yeah, yeah. How, how much no, of the no, mummy no. are you going to dissolve? This is smaller than the, than the dotted part of the semicolon, the quantity that we need. DNA is a long shot at this point. It doesn't survive outside a living organism for more than a few minutes, let alone millions of years. However, DNA encodes for proteins. Proteins are pretty tough. And the proteins of a specific animal can be very, very specialized to that type of animal. Which means researchers can use protein to track a species' ancestors. Early reptiles, in the case of dinosaurs, or its descendants, like birds. 
Birds are the direct descendants of predatory dinosaurs. If we find an avian protein within a hadrosaur, suddenly it draws them all that more closer to their distant relative, the predatory dinosaurs. Indicating the hadrosaur line of dinosaurs would be much more bird-like than we ever thought. Wolgalius is testing for a particularly hardy protein called beta-keratin, which is found in both reptiles and birds. He isolates the protein from a goose feather and blasts it with infrared light to generate its unique fingerprint or spectrum. He then repeats the procedure on the dino mummy samples. You can see that this spectrum from the feather has some similarity to the spectrum that we've taken from the sediments near the dino mummy. A match indicates that some of Dakota's 67 million year old genetic building blocks still dwell in the rock. The preliminary results look to me as though you do have beta keratin preserved in the skin sample. Now that, that, that would be, that's goosebumps time, that's amazing if that's the case. It's a promising first step, but the team is cautious. They could be detecting only fragments of a once complete protein or contamination from other organisms. To be sure, they send the samples on to a molecular imaging center down the road in Manchester. We are frustratingly close to finding what any paleontologist dreams of finding, and that is original proteins within the organism they're studying. We are very, very close. We have got the cigar, but it is not quite lit yet. While they await an answer, the tedious work of chipping and scraping and brushing away the ancient rocks surrounding Dakota now kicks in full force in preparation for the big CT scan. One major hope is that much of the tissue and muscle that separated its outer skin from its bones within has fossilized in place. If scientists can quantify how much muscle mass there is, they can, for the very first time, realistically portray how a dinosaur moved. Dinosaurs did not move like birds. Dinosaurs did not move like humans. They moved like dinosaurs. And this will be the first opportunity to show how dinosaurs moved. So if I keep the University of Manchester's Dr. Bill Sellers is a locomotion biologist. He spends most of his time designing complex computer models that describe how living creatures get around. He now plans to apply the same techniques to large, extinct animals. It is a problem, but physics hasn't changed. Muscle is exactly as strong as it always was. Bones are very much the same as they always were. Newton still rules. Which means whether an animal is extinct or not, based solely on the size and configuration of its muscles and bones, Seller's supercomputer can find the quickest way to get the creature from point A to point B. Considering the almost infinite combinations of moves involved in achieving this, it takes a lot of processing power to determine how best to do it, even on a human model. So you start off with a random set. And it's just like a you know, one-year-old learning to walk. You have to make a few mistakes. A hundred thousand mistakes, in fact, just to get us to learn to take a half a step and fall over. Even that, though, is a step forward. And if we start from there now, then we, we're that little bit closer to our goal. And what we find is if we repeat this, and this has been repeated 762,000 times, and we get something like this. After a million more attempts, we're skipping along. But eventually, the computer takes on a runner's stance and peaks at nearly 29 kilometers per hour. About as fast as a pro football player. An accurate representation of what we can do. The same can be said for other animals. 
ostriches, today's fastest bipeds, at 72 kilometers per hour. Emus, at 48. Horses, at over 80. And since the computer's predictions for living animals work well, the scientists expect the same to hold true for extinct ones. All Sellers needs is dinosaur data to feed into his machine. The 3D structure is absolutely key. It's the one bit of the puzzle that we don't have. We know how big they are. What we don't know is how muscly they were. If you have a skinny dinosaur, it's not going to walk as fast or run as fast as a really muscly dinosaur. While Sellers awaits the CT results to finally tell this story in full, he trains his models using estimates of Dakota's muscle mass for modern crocs and birds. And gets skeletal dimensions by laser scanning the bones of another young hadrosaur of similar size. Once again, it be. Considering the almost infinite combinations of moves involved in achieving this, it takes a lot of processing power to determine how best to do it, even on a human model. So you start off with a random set. And it's just like a you know, one-year-old learning to walk. You have to make a few mistakes. A hundred thousand mistakes, in fact, just to get us to learn to take a half a step and fall over. Even that, though, is a step forward. And if we start from there now, then we, we're that little bit closer to our goal. And what we find is if we repeat this, and this has been repeated 762,000 times, and we get something like this. After a million more attempts, we're skipping along. But eventually, the computer takes on a runner's stance and peaks at nearly 29 kilometers per hour. About as fast as a pro football player. An accurate representation of what we can do. The same can be said for other animals. Ostriches, today's fastest bipeds, at 72 kilometers per hour. Emus, at 48. Horses, at over 80. And since the computer's predictions for living animals work well, the scientists expect the same to hold true for extinct ones. All Sellers needs is dinosaur data to feed into his machine. The 3D structure is absolutely key. It's the one bit of the puzzle that we don't have. We know how big they are, what we don't know is how muscly they were. If you have a skinny dinosaur, it's not going to walk as fast or run as fast as a really muscly dinosaur. While Sellers awaits the CT results to finally tell this story in full, he trains his models using estimates of Dakota's muscle mass for modern crocs and birds get skeletal dimensions by laser scanning the bones of another young hadrosaur of similar size. Once again, the search begins. Eric starts, it puts its legs in a fairly random sort of position and bingo, you know, it just falls flat in its face. 100,000 cycles later, it's a little bit better but as you can see, it's going to do a single step and then it all goes horribly wrong again. After 100 million tries, our hadrosaur can finally stay on its feet and cruise along at about 45 kilometers per hour. quite as fast as a galloping horse, but it's, it's really a, a pretty creditable speed for something as large as, as our hadrosaur. If I start the cycle... And with the help of an additional piece of software called Dynomorph, Sellers and his colleague Kent Stevens can take this run cycle beyond speed. 
More estimates from fossils and modern animals allow the program to account for details like center of mass and range of motion in the joints and reveal the creature's form and posture. We want to know whether these dinosaurs were, were very sort of Godzilla-like and upright or whether they were very horizontal. The team has already approximated how Cretaceous creatures like T. rex and Triceratops moved, based on their skeletons alone. Now, the scientists hold their breath for the CT results, which will for the first time allow an animal to run as it did 67 million years ago. Before our dinosaur mummy can take a single step, all four and a half tons worth of it sets off on a 2,000 kilometer journey to the enormous CT scanner just north of Los Angeles. It arrives at the Boeing facility on schedule and intact. But for senior engineer Jeff Anders and the CT scanning team, the challenges are just beginning. This is far, by far the biggest and the heaviest piece that's ever been scanned. It's going to be a challenge. This site has seen a fair share of its own challenges. The Saturn V rocket engines that launched the Apollo astronauts to the moon were tested and built here, as were lasers for the Star Wars missile defense system. Anders himself has averted disaster here by spotting hairline fractures in space shuttle parts. The challenge before the crew today, fitting Dakota onto the scanner. Unlike a CT scan at a hospital where x-rays spin around a patient, in the world's largest CT scanners, which have to accommodate objects of all different sizes and shapes, the patient spins. Whoa, 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 that's whoa, tipping. Whoa, whoa. That's, that's tipping at this end, it's tipping. It's not resting on this runner at all. Dakota is the largest patient this machine has ever examined. And right now, it's too large. Well, what are we thinking about? We have, uh, we have to move it over a little bit. The whole thing over? Well, we got 17 inches hanging off the other side. You? Yeah. What's worse, even if the team does manage to squeeze it on, Anders isn't convinced his 6 million electron volt X-ray source is powerful enough to penetrate and image the three and a half ton body block. So we're talking four to six hour scans to pull any detail out of this. Whoa. While the scientists work out the kinks on the large hunk of rock, it's the moment of truth for the much, much smaller ones back in Manchester those dino toenail clippings. Scientists at the Wolfson Molecular Imaging Center have spent two months trying to purify, isolate, and identify the protein beta keratin from the samples. These two peaks are lots of peptides in here. After months of anticipation, they have good and bad news for Manning. So looking at the gels, you're saying have we got organics or not? We, we can't identify anything as a protein. Unfortunately, the mummy samples are too degraded to identify beta keratin. The protein appears to have broken into tiny fragments that for now at least, the scientists can't recognize. Even fragments though, offer some promise to Manning. This is the first ever skin envelope organics that have been recovered from an animal which is, what, 67 million years old. I think that's pretty remarkable. Grand plans to redraw the dinosaur family tree will have to wait until the team can find intact proteins to analyze. But the scientists are not giving up hope. We've looked at three small grains from a 10,000 pound um, specimen. The story isn't finished here. Never give up when you're looking for something as elusive as a protein molecule in a dinosaur which is over 65 million years old. Manning's stiff upper lip comes in handy back in California. 
I don't know. It's, uh, After days of hair pulling, nail biting, uh, gut wrenching uh, engineering, the crew squeezes Dakota's massive body onto the CT scanner. <laughs> come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. This was this was measured for this, wasn't it? <laughs> now, the concrete door shuts. The X-rays stream. And the mummy finally spins. As it turns, the CT scanner takes millimeter thin x-rays of the dinosaur from every angle, moving vertically up the block after each rotation. The slices are then stacked together, like a digital deck of cards, offering a three-dimensional cross-section of the patient. That's if the x-rays get through. Nothing this big has ever been scanned before. After the longest hour of Manning's career, the first slice comes in. There's not enough x-rays going through. It's just really dense. The grainy black screen indicates even the six million electron volts emitted by the giant x-ray aren't penetrating the dense rock encasing our mummy. This is just amazing. I've never seen anything this dense. There is something in it. As the team tries blasting through the rock with more and more x-rays, what was initially meant to take a few days stretches to weeks and months, time afforded thanks to Boeing's goodwill. While they haven't given up hope, after four months, many of Dakota's secrets, its gender, its internal organs, its skull, the crocodile that fossilized alongside it, remain impervious to the x-rays. But not all of its secrets. The CT scanner may be no match for the mummy's three and a half ton body, but it easily slices through the more petite one ton tail. It's missing. And results here don't disappoint. Right. That's a relief. Yeah. <laughs> we have got the whole tail. Oh, that's good. Immediately obvious, the spacing of the dinosaur's vertebra. This is the first time we've been able to actually quantify where the skin is relative to the bones. And you can actually zoom in and even start measuring the distances between each individual vertebrae to the next vertebra and the next. Most museum skeletons have these bones stacked tightly against each other. The soft tissue in the Dakota scans seem to indicate they should be set about a centimeter apart. Dinosaurs may be longer than we previously thought. You could stick a meter on every dinosaur in the world. <laughs> Imagine I'd stick a bit. At least. <laughs> stick a bit more on the big ones, wouldn't you? Absolutely. Even more exciting. The tail scan finally provides some of the muscle data Manning and Sellers so desperately need to get our hadrosaur up and running. A first in dinosaur locomotion. So we know this is skin here, and you can track it through to the skin envelope that's here. Enormous, isn't it? It, it's really deep. Look at the depth. I know. And, and that's where you've got your huge muscle group for the tails. It's muscles in the tail that power the hind legs and act as a dinosaur's main engine. The CT scan confirms Dakota's was more inflated than anyone ever expected. You're gonna have to rejig things to take account of that. With a little number crunching and 10 million learning cycles on Seller's supercomputer, this is how Dakota moved. Up on two legs, head parallel to the ground and approaching top speeds of some 45 kilometers per hour this was no cow this is our emu this is our ostrich this is our human this is our saurus this is t-rex and there is our hadrosaur the data suggests that in a full-on race it would run 16 kilometers per hour faster than the fastest t-rex For the tyrant lizard to catch one of these animals, as it so often did, 
It would likely prey on the sick or young, or use stealth like a big carnivorous cat hunting herds of gazelle. You've got to remember, if this thing is being chased by T-Rex, it's running it for its life, whereas T-Rex is just running for dinner. One false step by an unsuspecting hadrosaur, though, and it's on its way to becoming the next great fossil find. Whether this is how young Dakota met its final end is still unclear. We know that there is a large chunk of flesh missing from its torso. But we can't tell if this is from a T-Rex bite or partial decomposition. Cause of death could have easily been injury or disease. Either way, in its final moments, it's fair to say Dakota would have likely meandered on or near its green lush riverbank and lain down to rest in peace. For another 67 million years, that is. This single specimen has brought us closer than we ever have been to understanding where these animals lived, how they looked, how they moved, and how they survived into the afterlife. And though scientists may have to rely on more traditional means to uncover additional clues, Dakota's case is far from closed. We'll continue to analyze this dinosaur probably for the rest of my life, and even, and even after that, or really just beginning. This one offers a vast amount of data, a huge amount of information that will help us reinterpret not only this group, but have impact for the way we reconstruct almost all dinosaurs. It has been released from its rocky tomb after 67 million years. And this mummy will never rest again.